Father, we thank you for your presence in our midst. The presence, Lord, that we will not take for granted. Because we know what it was like, Lord, when we were without Jesus. There's no peace, no love, and no joy. Father, even though we may have walked many years with you and live in your presence for many years since we have come to know you and the Lord Jesus yet each day your presence is even more precious and help us Lord not to forget there are many others who have never heard you who never know this peace this love this joy and this presence. And help us, Lord, to always reach out to those who still need to know you, who have yet to hear you. Oh, Father, even as we look into your word, let it not be just a mental exercise. Let it not be more knowledge we receive. But let it be a special impartation of growth into our life in your presence. Let us, even as we sit in your presence, experience an awesomeness and a revelation not in our mind alone, but in the depth of our heart. A revelation that will open the depth of our soul to the presence of God. We ask, O God, that you minister your life into us as we sit at your very throne and your very feet. Minister, O oh God, your light to us. Lord, we trust and we love you. And we know, O oh God, that your word is like a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing a thunder of soul and spirit. Father God, please in your own special way, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Move over this place and over the hearts and lives and the spirits of each one here. Where their spirits are weak, strengthen them. Where their fires are weak, lighten and burn it brighter, Lord. Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will infuse into our lives a measure of your dominion, a measure of your power, a measure of your presence, as we sit in your presence, in worship and in awe. And we covenant with you, O precious Father, to always give you all the glory and all the worship and the honor that is always due unto you. We pray all this, Father God, in Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. This is the fifth session on the Gospel of Matthew, gleanings on the Gospel of Matthew. We've been translating through the Bible and we are looking at the Gospel of Matthew. We will finish it in six sessions. We have covered five chapters at a time. And this morning we will cover from chapter 21 to chapter 24. We are not able to cover every verse or every passage, but what we have been doing is give you gleaming certain particular emphases that we see in the Greek that we could not express forth in an English translation to give you an understanding of the depth of the treasures that can be found in God's Word. And I pray that through this you will love God's Word more than life itself. Looking over at Matthew chapter 21, if you have your Bible. Chapter 21 primarily consists of Jesus entering into Jerusalem to start a new phase in his ministry, his final phase. He has completed all the circuit traveling around Capernaum, Galilee, etc. And now is his final phase where he confronts the Jewish leaders and for the last time gives them the message that God gave to him. And for the last time, give them an opportunity to turn to God. And in chapter 21, we see his triumphant entry. 
followed by many teachings and parables. Chapter 22, his confrontation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, where he completely answered every question under no one there to answer any question in verse 46. And, I, and when I came to verse 46, I laughed because uh, it's so, they, they put it in a very funny way in the original. In uh, chapter 22, the last verse. I like the old King James translation, which is put it in this way. Let me see what the new King James says in chapter 22, verse 46. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. Now here's what uh, my version says. It says, and no man was able to answer him a word. See, that comes up more powerful. No one was able to answer him a word, Neither dare anyone from that day forth ask him any more questions. He completely silenced them at the end of chapter 22. And in chapter 23 is a very strong chapter. The strongest reprimand and rebuke that you ever find the Lord Jesus Christ entering into. And remember that it was done at the end of his ministry, not at its beginning. Many people, when they begin the ministry, they want to begin in Matthew 23. I'm sorry for you. You don't begin in Matthew 23. You know, I believe something about the law of correction. When you correct people, you must reach a certain point before you can correct. If you don't reach that point, you're in no position even though you can detect that there's some things that need to be corrected. I learned some things when I was doing the gardening in... Uh, in, in my home, uh, once in a while, sometimes when you come back from the office between, uh, between those times, uh, between the time the sun sets and from the time I just came back, just do a little bit of gardening. And uh, incidentally, I never loved gardening. I learned five things while doing the gardening. Five things. The parable of the garden. Praise the Lord. Verse one. <laughs> no. The five things I learned. See, I never liked gardening. When we were in our rented house in Tamamega, our, we, we, we just did what we can and left it there. And uh, James Tan, who used to stay with us long, long ago, he, he was pretty good as a gardener. Why, why didn't I like gardening? Because whenever I put those plants in and, and this Japanese bamboo, etc., they don't seem to prosper. In fact, they seem to die. So I used to confess, I think earlier I used to confess, no, I don't have green fingers at all, mine are yellow. And turns the plant yellow. I don't have green fingers at all. And then when you move into your whole other things can happen. I found out, number one, that sometimes you never know that the hidden talent could be inside. And uh, so I just started doing a little bit here and a little bit there. And I found that it can be quite interesting. Suddenly something that I hate became something that I quite enjoy. I hate to dig the soil, I hate to mow the grass, I hate to do all those things. I just want to love pray and, and, and read God's word and go for prayer walk. But I found lesson one. The things you hate can change in the things that you love. Not overnight, but gradually. Gradually. And I know I love gardening, I love the flowers. And I think that the flowers and the plants can sense it. Because now when I plant, they don't die. <laughs> Maybe they knew that I didn't like them. <laughs> and uh, so when I touch them, they die. <laughs> but uh, that's the first thing I learned. Second thing I learned about correction. We're talking about chapter 23 correction. See one fine day, uh, I used to have a gardener come and he did all these things, but after suddenly he was infrequent and he never came again. And uh, he used to trim the hedges for me. So in the end, when it was a bit too wow, I decided to do a bit of trimming. And I saw him trim. Every time he trimmed, it grew more branches. And so I tried a little bit and it worked. More branches grew. So guess what? If you work a little bit, go all the way. And so one fine day, I really give it a good trimming. It was really short and bota. I was so confident that it would grow back. 
And I watched over several weeks. The leaves started turning yellow. There must be something wrong that I have done. And uh, so after some time we consult some people who were good at that. Say, what's wrong? My gardener came by and said, what's wrong? And, and, I, and he said, oh, we need fertilizer. And now I learned something. That whenever you trim those plants, you must look at the weather condition. And uh, whether it's raining or sunny, if you trim during a time when it's too hot and not enough water, the plant is, will go through stress and may not do as well. And then I also learned that when you trim the plants, you must put fertilizer at the same time. So what you take away, you give an extra boost. And then the plant, while you're being chopped, the, I imagine the, the plant's hand being chopped off. <laughs> and then you give more fertilizer. <laughs> and then it grows extra branches. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just very visual in my imagination. <laughs> and I just found that you got to put fertilizer at that time. And that teaches me a lesson about, second lesson about from the garden, correcting people. Whenever you correct people, you must look at the weather conditions. <laughs> See, they are like plants. And uh, maybe they are going through a hard time. The sun is shining on their lives like the Sahara Desert. And then you come and correct them at that time, you cut, cut, cut. Not only will they become both up, but they die in the correction. And I also learned that you have to put fertilizer. It means you've got to give something that will boost them up. And uh, every time you correct somebody, you've got to give them something that can hang on to. Because they've been rebuked left, right, center. I know. Uh, so get a fertilizer ready, which is the word of God, word of encouragement, or love, or something that will encourage their life. That will be like a fertilizer to them, give them extra boost in life. So that's the second lesson I learned from my garden. Third lesson I learned from my garden, all these are spiritual lessons. Now I know why Jesus likes to speak in parables. <laughs> I can't help it because I tend to meditate in God's word. Whatever I do, I try to see pictures of God's word inside. <laughs> and... Uh, some of you have been doing gardening for years and you didn't see that. <laughs> but the third point I learned when I do the garden was I have money plants that creep all over the pillars in my house. And uh, I found that when the plants are young, you could force them to go in any direction you want. But when they grow old and the stem has hardened, it's very hard to move them. They become permanently glued to certain positions. And so if I want my money plant to creep in certain direction, when the shoot comes up, I would tie a little string and force it into that position and thus bring my plant wherever I want. Hallelujah. Wherever I lead them, they follow. <laughs> but if they are too old, you can't do that. I learned a third lesson. Uh, is it a third, third lesson for my garden? And that is, we have to catch people while they are on fire and when they are, are fresh in the things of God. And whenever people have been touched by God, that's the time you can come in and mold their lives. Don't wait until they solidify and crystallize. They'll be too hardened to shape and form. And it's important that, and I learned that, it's important that we re remain pliable. We remain uh, contrite and humble so that God can keep forming us and turning us into the direction He wants us to flow in the will of God for us. Fourth lesson I learned uh, for my garden that different fertilizer produce different things. And you put the wrong fertilizer, all you have are lots of leaves and no flowers. And then if you want lots of flowers, you've got to put the right type of fertilizer to get the flowers out, and the timing must be exact. And uh, when I was trying to plant some morning glory, I guess I must have put a wrong fertilizer because the moment it's six inches tall, it produces a flower. And it stopped growing too fast. It flowered too fast. I learned a fourth lesson that revelation needs to be given a portion at a time. The revelations of God that come into our lives has a rightness of time. They are like different types of fertilizer. Just like Jesus, He revealed to them He's the suffering Messiah after they accept Him as the coming Messiah. 
So revelation must be given at the right time. If you give it in the wrong time, it can be destructive to the people. In a, in a quickened development in their life that is not supposed to be developed yet. And therefore make them a dwarf. And that's dangerous in some things of God. So there must be a right time to give the revelation of God. There must be a right time to deliver a dark face of the Lord. And every time God gives you a vision or dream or revelation, it may not be time to deliver. There's a right time to develop, deliver the right thing. The fifth lesson I learned uh, uh, from the gardening experience is that too much water can destroy a plant as much as too little water. If your plants are in a pot and you put lots and lots of water, since a little water did well, put lots of it. That's your logical thinking. But if there's too much water and your plants in a pot are wet all the time, the roots begin to rot. So too much water is not good, too little water is not good. It must be just nice. And it's much better that it has some water every day than you put water for one whole year. Put it in a swimming pool. <laughs> the plants will die. Not all plants can, can take off. Different, different types of plants can take different conditions. And some plants can grow more in more watery conditions. Some plants cannot. In Sabah, I went to a farm and I visited a farmer. And uh, I went to his land and he showed me his land and he was building a fish pond. And I said, why are you building a fish pond here? He told me because this particular area of the soil has lots of ground water. He said, not many types of tree can grow here. He said, durian trees cannot grow here, it's too wet. And you say, the other fruit trees cannot grow, so I will convert it to a fish pond, to real fish. So you can see that too much water is not good, too little water is not good. And then there are different types of plants that can take different amounts of water. They can stand there. Of course, the water lily can practically live with the roots in the water. And so I learned a few lessons. And that is, when the Holy Spirit moves, some of us can take different amounts of the Holy Spirit. You can let go of your emotions. But some of us, if we over let go, we don't know how to get back. And uh, we begin to get destabilized. And we're not be, we don't become very stable at all. And so there is a correct amount of spirit exposure that all of us need. Some of us may be able to take more, some may be take a little bit at a time. Each one of us are different plants in the Lord. And uh, as we move into the things of the Spirit, I realize that there are some, some who, are, who have grown strong and they can stand more water. They can stand more depth of the Spirit. Some cannot stand it. And uh, we need to flow along to each their level. And as they grow, they can grow deeper and deeper into the things of God. Five little lessons from my garden. We happen to touch on that because of chapter 23, Jesus correcting the Pharisees. And uh, <clears throat> chapter 4, he was still talking, his, chapter 24, he was talking about the end times, the last days. Now as I was translating this scripture and looking at it in the Greek, there was a particular verse in chapter 23 that stood out more than any other verses. See, we are talking about correction. How Jesus corrected the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And let's remember this. We thank God for the Word. We thank God for the grace period. But remember even in grace period that we are under, we have accountability. There comes to a point of time where we have to answer before God for the revelations that we are receiving. And God is going to ask us, what are you doing about those things that you know about, that I have taught you? There comes a point in our time that we must begin to act out what we have absorbed. And yet Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because so much chances are given to them. And they're not responding to God. They're not responding to the work of the Holy Spirit and softening their heart. Instead, they hardened their hearts against Jesus. And in fact, the 23 was the last confrontation before Jesus, in a sense, gave them up. In chapter 23, as he confronted them, the strong words that he used, when he says in verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees see in Moses' seat, and all their works they do in verse 5 to be seen by men, they make their phylacteries broad. Phylacteries are little scriptures that they write and they fold it and they carry it about. 
uh, on their bodies. The, this was phylactery. And enlarge the borders of their garments, etc. And as I see all those things and see Jesus rebuke and reprimand upon them, a thought came very strong to me. Why are they that way? And then there's one strong word that came out, a simple word that, that didn't get my attention until I was reading it in the Greek. And that is worth looking over here at uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 6. They love, they love the best places at feast, the best seats in the synagogue. Verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mean and anise and cumin and are neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. This you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Verse 6, The word love is not the word agape. It's the word phileo. And phileo is the word that expresses Friendship, love, affection, human bonding. Friendship, love is where the word phileo comes from. And then I realized as I read it that there is actually an emphasis on the word phileo. Jesus was saying that they had given their phileo love to the wrong area. Their phileo was being abused and neglected into the wrong avenue. When I saw it, I began to cross-reference to other places where Jesus began to speak against the Pharisees and about these areas. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. Matthew chapter 6 verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they phileo to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Again, it's the word phileo. Then in chapter 10, verse 37. Chapter 10, verse 37. He who, he who phileo father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who phileo son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. When we read it, we always think that that verse is agape. Remember this. Jesus asks you to agapa, which is a word for agape, from the word agape, which means God's kind of love. Jesus asks us to agapa your parents, your loved one, your wife, your husband, your, your, your children. You are supposed to constantly give them the agape love. But the final love, Jesus says he wants it. He says if you finally your father, your mother, your sons, your daughters more than me, he cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus talking about? Jesus wants to be your closest friend. I never saw it before. But when I began to re-look at the word phileo in Matthew and how Matthew used it, I realized Jesus was saying here, he, he was not trying to tear you away from your father, mother, wife or husband. Jesus was saying he wants to be your closest friend. In other words, he was saying in Matthew chapter 10, if, any, if you have any other friend closer to you than I am, you cannot be my disciple. And when I think about being a disciple, I think about the discipline, the cost, the hardship, the suffering, the shame you back, for Jesus. And I can understand it. See, if Jesus is not your best friend, you will not be willing to pay the price. Isn't that right? If Jesus is not your best friend, you will not be willing 
to pay the price. What a friend we have been, Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to care. He asks you to pay, to take the shame that may come when you bear His name and the world persecutes you. And I think that's a root problem in many Christians' lives. Oh God, my Christian life is hard and tough because Jesus is not your best friend. He wants your filial. He wants to be your best friend. Then when we bring it over to the book of Matthew 23, why, why did the Pharisees and the Sadducees become the way they are? So hard-hearted. You know, in this world, we need to know some fundamental Principle. We use things and we love people. Say we use things and we love people. But in the world, most of the time, humans unregenerate, unregenerated by God, by the Spirit of God, they use people. And they love things. Say the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they love things and they use people. That is what's wrong with them. Now I'll prove it from Matthew 23. Look at how they behave and what they do. Why do they love the best seats in the synagogue? See, they love things. A seat is a thing. A position is a thing. Money is a thing. Cars are things. Houses are things. Possessions are things. They love things. They love position. But you know what's the problem? They don't love people. Remember the story in Mark chapter 1 and chapter 2. As Jesus confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and Jesus entered the synagogue. And there were a lot of Pharisees in chapter 3, that is Mark chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. There were a lot of Pharisees watching him. And there was a poor man with a, with a hand that is withered. For many years he had been suffering. And you know what it is like when you have an invalid living with you. You know the hardship, you know the pain. And this man has been very faithful. He could have been attending the synagogue Saturday after Saturday. But one day, Jesus was there. The parents of 10,000, the bright and morning star, the friend who sticker closer than a brother. Jesus 
what then? And Jesus saw the pain in this man's life. He saw the hurt in his heart. He saw the need on his body. And his love reaches out to this man to heal this man. But the Pharisees didn't see the man. They saw the beauty of their synagogue. They saw the rightness of their religious creed. They saw all the things, things and things which they loved. And they had no love for that man. And Jesus said, Jesus looked around in Mark chapter 3 and he was disappointed, he was grieved, and he was angry in verse 5. Here were the highest so-called spiritual leaders in the land who should have been the closest to what we got. And they don't even have any feeling for a poor little man who came to church with a need in his life. They were more conscious about whether the Sabbath was kept or not. They were no more conscious of the need of the people's life. Those were the Pharisees. They loved things and they used people. If they cannot use those people, they will put that aside. And Jesus in Matthew 23 pointed to these things all the time. Look at some of the things. And you'll find it ringing over and over again. They love things. They love things. And they use people. Verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now, why didn't they allow it? Because they were more interested in, the, in, in their status quo than in actual conversion. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Verse 14. For you devour widows' houses. Now, look at that. They were interested in things. They had given their final year to things and not to human beings. They had made things their best friend. Long ago when I was staying in Tamaniga, across from me is one of my neighbors, Mr. L, I call him. Every morning, when he, bought, when he bought, changed his car and bought his new car, he would do his, to me, it's like his morning devotion in his car. Without fail, every morning when he would go out for a walk, he's dead washing his car. And my wife and I used to say that, used to say that that's his morning devotion. <laughs> because he loved his car, his new car. He loved him. That's the root problem of the Pharisees. When they saw the poor widows, they don't care for them. They care for what the widows have and not for what the widows are themselves. Let me tell you, out in the world, there are not many people, I, I pray there will be more, and I pray that every one of you will be like that, the good type of people. But there are not many people who really love you and be a friend to you without your position, without your money, without your influence, without your wealth. Because most of the people are only there because of your position, because of your wealth. You know how you will know it? The day you lose your wealth, see if they are around. The day you become infamous, you may be famous now, but the day you become persecuted and your name is run down, I mean, things will happen to you, like Joseph in the Bible. He was innocently framed up. I mean, things can happen that way. Suddenly you're infamous, wrongly or rightly. See whether they are around. They are not. Because the people in the world love things and they use people. As a pastor, I strive to love people for who they are. And I always tell people, 
Whether you come to this church with a title, without a title, rich or poor, I will treat you the same way. If you're rich, don't expect me to treat you any different from a poor man. Although out there you have people called out to you, but in church, it's not because we are proud, it's because we want equality. Like I say, my philosophy in life is this. When it comes to doing work, I believe in professional standards. I want the best work for God. When it comes to doing work and any project, I expect the most professional thing possible. But when it comes to fellowship, for me, it's uttermost simplicity. In our colloquial language, we call it chin chai. Anything goes. Which means that, I mean, uh, wherever you are, even if you live in a low squatter hut and you have to sit on your cement floor and we, we drink nothing but a little bit of uh, orange squash water, fine. I would love to fellowship at that level. Let's take off all the mask and take off all the artificial thing the world put. And that is why our vision for this church is that we find an equality in God. Rich or poor, famous or infamous, and that's why you could be the most famous person in the world and you come and choose a tender church. Let me tell you, we will not give you any special extra intention that we should normally do. Because one thing I have learned, even the famous and the rich want real friends. Hello there. They want real friends. And the people who are really needy and poor, they also want real friends. And that is why when I tell people, if you have to give something to the poor, Give it without robbing them of their dignity of a human being. You know, sometimes if you give it, you know, you rob them of the dignity of their being a human being. Don't do it that way. They are human beings that need respect and honor. And if they are children of God even more, whether we are children of God who live in a mansion or children of God who live in a squatter, let me tell you, that person is a child of the King of Kings and a Lord of Lords. Can you give an amen for that? And we need to give them the respect and the honor due to them as a redeemed human being of the Lord. And here in Matthew chapter 23, the Pharisees, they love things and they use people. See, they take advantage of the reader. For a pretense, make long prayers. They don't really mean it. They just want those positions. They want recognition. These are all things. Things that pass away. And look at what they, they said here in, in verse 16. Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. Whoever swears by the goal of the temple, is obliged to perform it. Now, doesn't that reveal that they love things? And they use people. Fools and blind, Jesus said. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? So Jesus put them back in the right perspective. And the key word is, is in verse 6, the word phileo. They have given their phileo to the wrong area. And if we are not careful... The affection that we have in our lives. Philo is affectionate love. We're not talking about agape love, that's spiritual love. But filial love is, has a human quality in war. And the human quality can be attached to things if they're not careful. We become attached to a car, to a possession, to a property, to things, to a position, to a title. And then spiritually we become stunted. And we need help. We need help. And you know, if you keep traveling along that road, before long, you turn around. There are no friends. Because you have given your filial and dissipated your filial to things. And when the things around you don't satisfy you, things around you cannot love you. Your car can't say, I love you. Your house cannot say, I love you. Your possession cannot say, I love you. But only a human being can say, I love you. Isn't that wonderful? And that's the first word that you will receive. We're going to focus on only two Greek words. Phileo. And I think on the positive side, 
the most beautiful thing that you've ever done in your life is to learn to love another human being. Try it. There's nothing like it. Of course, the agape love of God is involved. But then agape and Philia works together. And of course, Jesus is your best friend, your closest friend. But here's, here's a paradox. How can you love God whom you cannot see unless you love the body of Christ whom you can see? Which represents the presence of God on this earth. That's in the book of First John. And I found that the greatest treasures that we can ever build in our lives, the greatest savings and FD or, and the greatest accumulation of wealth we can ever have in our lives is the treasures in our heart that we find when we love other human beings. There's something more precious than silver and gold about it. You know, there's nothing more touching in life when you have love for human beings, you felt their feelings, you felt their suffering, you felt all that they, they are, and you help them with pure love, with pure affection, and you have empathized in all that they have gone through. And then the human being turns around, is born again, touched by the Lord, and comes back to you one day and says, I love you. For all that you have done, because of your love for Jesus, I want you to know, I appreciate it, and I love you. Let me tell you, your car cannot say I love you, your house cannot say I love you, but human beings can say, I love you, from your heart. And I pray that we understand that our filial must never be given to things. Philo must be given to, our, to Jesus first of all. And then after that, we give it to our fellow man. Of course, to your husbands and to your wives, to your family. But then you extend it outwards to all those body of Christ and the people in the world. And when you're able to give out that Philo, the most precious thing that you will hear, the three most precious words in the English language, you can hear that are worth more than silver and gold when a human being who may not have much comes and says, Thank you. I love you because of Jesus' love. Hallelujah. You may have a little son or a little daughter. You may have a child, a grown-up son or a grown-up daughter. You can give them the best in life. You can give them the wealth that you want. You can give them your inheritance that you want. But don't you agree that the most precious moment in your life is not when they have their own car. It's not when they bought their own house. It's not when they got married and walked down the aisle with a bride or bridegroom. The most precious moment of your entire life with your sons and daughters are when they can come to you and say, Mom, I love you. Dad, I love you. Let me tell you, money can never buy that. All the silver and the gold cannot buy that. And the only way to grow in our life and become soft and tender and to be a true disciple of Jesus is to give our failure to Him. And then give our file to human beings. Love people, you stay. Say love people, you stay. Say that aloud. Love people, you stay. To grow in our lives and become soft and tender and to be a true disciple of Jesus is to give our file to Him. And then give our filial to human beings. Love people, 
you stink. Say love people. You stink. Say that aloud. Love people. You stink. Now how do we move into this phileo? The word phileo has another root form. One of its derivation is the, is the word philema. The word philema, in fact, which is tied to the word phileo, the word phileo has been translated as the word to kiss. See, it's a human emotion. It's a depth of feeling. Look at Matthew 26 verse 48. Here's the actual word phileo. Now his betrayer, that is Judas Iscariot, had given them a sign saying, and I'll read it with the Greek inside, Whomever I phileo, he is the one who sees him. And of course there was no English word that could translate that. It's the word phileo. He's actually saying, whomever I love, whomever I file you. But the English translators knew that the meaning is deeper than what we normally say, just love, love or like. Whomever I kiss, he is the one who sees him. Judas Iscariot had his file twisted. When he kissed Jesus, there were no feeling for Jesus. We need to learn how to give our file to Jesus and need to give file to people. And we have to examine our lives. Every time you add something more to your earthly ways, I call it. Things in this life are earthly ways. Possessions, money, cars, houses. Every time you add something to your wealth or to your prosperity, Check your file Do you still love people more than things? If somebody comes in and mess out your your thing, your new thing, do you get worked up, angry? If you do, you love the things more than people. I know sometimes people are house proud, or car proud, or things proud. <laughs> And we wouldn't allow anyone to touch those things. And little children will come and touch. No! We don't mind hurting the spirit of the child. We don't mind putting a memory in the child of an angry person scolding them. That may devastate their soul for the rest of their adult life. For the protection of one little plant. Now I'm not talking about being negligent or irresponsible. We could have handled it differently. You could have handled it in love. You see, it comes out the way you handle it, whether you love those things more than the human being. And if you love the human being more than the thing, you can still prevent them from destroying the thing. But it comes out differently. They will know that you love them. Isn't that right? You know, people know whether you really love them or they don't. Or you don't. It comes out. It comes out in the way you handle them. It comes out in the way you talk to them. Whether you really love them or you don't love them. And there are the different usages of the word phileo. That we want to look at is used for God, the relationship of God and the Lord Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 5. In fact, the Gospel of John is not just a revelation of agape love. It's a revelation of phileo love too. John chapter 5 verse 20. John chapter 5 verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. For the Father phileo the Son and shows him all things that he does. And in other passages like John 11 and John 12, it talks about Jesus phileo Lazarus. Lazarus family. So Jesus does show phileo too. There's a place for filial love in the body of Christ. We need to guard our affection. We need to guard our feelings. 
and be able to express it in the right way to human vessels. I think we human beings need a renovation in our mind and in our education system so that we would put a higher value for human souls than we do for things. I mean, we all have a value for things. How much is this car, car worth? How much is this house worth? But then, when we say how much is that person worth, we only evaluate the ability or the training of the person. We forgot that that person was made in the image of God. And that person is priceless. They could be the most untrained worker, the most incapable worker. But if we cannot find filial love for them, there's something Pharaoh says about us. And what is most important, the more spiritual we get, the more filial we must have. If you don't have your filial in the right box, in the right area, you may end up a Pharisee. So it's important to develop filial love or you will become like a Pharisee and a Sadducee. And as we look along at the Gospel of Matthew, there's another word that creeps up in chapter 23, verse 4 and verse 23. Let's look at verse 23 first. That's the second word that we want to look at. Jesus in speaking to the Pharisees said this word Woe to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of men and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice mercy and faith It's almost like being penny wise and pound foolish. They have major on the minor and minor on the major. That's a dangerous position to be in. And Jesus Christ in speaking to their lives says you neglected three things. Justice mercy and faith. They got carried away with the leaves and they forgot the forest. They got carried away with the laws and sub sub laws and they forgot the reason for the law's existence. Why it exists? Just like the story we hear about uh, the rose chicken and uh, it seems that in some places at first, they used to cut the chicken in two and put it in the oven and they roast it. I think Eugene was the one who shared that long ago, Eugene and Jenny. And uh, then he asked the mother, why must we cut the chicken in half and put it in? She says, I don't know. Uh, grandma used to do this. And go to grandma. Grandma! Why do we cut the chicken in half and put the chicken in? Grandma looks and says, I don't know. We used to do it all the time that way. Ask great-grandma. So, great-granny, why do we cut the chicken in half and put it in the oven? And great-granny looks up with a smile on her face and says, Well, great-grandson, Long ago, our ovens were too small for whole chicken. So, we cut the chicken in half and we put it in half at a time. Oh! But now, the ovens can take a whole chicken, two chicken, three chicken. But why are we still cutting the chicken in half and putting the chicken in? <laughs> the little parable of the roast chicken. One day we may have Philip's roast chicken, right? That was his old vision. 
Not sure whether it's alive now. Now it's Philip DC water. Praise God. <laughs> but uh, we have to see why those things are done. And Jesus says, You have neglected the, the, the principle. And you have gone into such a depth that you forgot that principles were made for people and not people for the principles. That's a paraphrase from Jesus saying, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Hallelujah. That is Jesus' worship. Right? Jesus' worship is different. <laughs> principles are made for people and not people for principles. The reason why they exist is that by keeping them, we could be the true kind of people who could be trusted, who could be loved, who could be related to. So that if you don't have principles in your life, I find it hard to relate to you. Because when you say yes, you mean no. When I say no, it means no. You say yes, yes is yes, no is no. But for you, yes is no, no is yes, and we are confused. So principles are necessary. And what they have neglected is they've gone even further than principles. They've gone into the methodology and they forgot everything about the origin. Jesus always brings them back. In the beginning, it was not so. Now here, I want to focus on the word here. Weightier matters of the law. The weightier matters of the law. The word weightier, I want to find out what the word weightier means and what significance it has and, and how important it is. And it says here that the word weightier is from the Greek word barus, and that's the second Greek word that you learn today, is the word barus. Can you say barus? It's Romanized as B-A-R-U-S. The word barus talks about the heart of the matter, the gist of the matter. And that's what the Pharisees had neglected so far in all that they are doing. That the root of the matter they forgot, the principle, the beginning, the reason why you cut the chicken in the half and not just putting it in the half in the oven. They forgot why things the law was made. And they got lost somewhere in the forest, among the leaves and the trees. The word barus is an interesting word. Let's look at chapter 23 verse 4. It's also used there. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. Now the word heavy is the word barus. Now have you, can you see the opposing thing? Jesus said you neglect the barus of the law, and over there they are binding the barus on people. Look, there are two barus. One is a bagos barus, one is tab <laughs> tabole barus. <laughs> What? This barus that they are binding. See, in verse 4, they are binding heavy weights on people. They are putting barus on people. Heavy burdens that cannot be borne. Same word barus. And I saw the word barus on the same usage. Holy Spirit began to say, there are two types of weight. There's a weight that is external, and there's a weight that's internal. There's an external weight that can be crushing. See, if you begin to carry heavy things externally, there is only a certain limit before your body cannot take it. And it becomes heavier and heavier and how you walk is different. Have you seen how the uh, ladies are expecting walk? Praise the Lord. And uh, actually it's funny, we men always have it the easy way. The ladies bear the child, 
pregnancy for nine months and they bear with all the discomfort, everything. Then they have to go to child labor and uh, of course they can believe God that it will be just contractions and painless and redeem on the curse of the law. But still they go through the process and after that the baby comes up and is a baby boy or baby girl, whatever. And then everybody come and congratulate you. Congratulations, you're a father. Hallelujah. Praise God, you've done all the hard work. <laughs> the mother doing all the hard work. And uh, I read in one article one day about this, this uh, class for expectant fathers. To help them empathize with their wives. They invented a, a, a contraption which they attached to the man's body to let them feel what it was like to be pregnant so that they could understand their wives more. And uh, so one of the fathers uh, uh, put it on and uh, the contraption is so well designed that it even kicks a bit so that the father knows now your baby is kicking you. And... Uh, so the father would be walking at about nine months pregnancy and uh, then he said, all right now, can you go about your housework? Yes, we can, <laughs> confidently said the father. Then he drop down a few things and a few things are dropping and he said, okay, I want you to pick up that thing over there. And he goes, oh, 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 boom, the baby gave a kick, boom, boom. And uh, finally, he found he couldn't bend down. Let me tell you, that was the last time he tell his pregnant wife to pick up things. After that class. So what he did, he went near and uh, he gave a kick and then he catch it. <laughs> I tell you, if the wife tried to do that, it won't be good for their baby. I haven't seen pregnant ladies trying to pick up things by kicking it up. <laughs> And that was an interesting thing that I read about. <laughs> that empathy, that, that feeling that was necessary, uh, it, was, it was done in that class. And uh, there is a certain weight that comes on the body when a lady is expecting, and the back actually arch a bit. Your sleeping position is change had to change to be comfortable and your walking position has changed in order to carry the weight of the baby because the weight is added on you however if the weight is like the growth of your bones your muscles internally you don't feel much like uh, uh, if, if your weight is internal and not just an external flap that's added around your tummy your middle age spread and uh, some people have a walking pulpit. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Take away the pulpit, they don't need it. In fact, it's blocking them. <laughs> you can put your Bible. Imagine a walking pulpit will be quite fun for some preachers. You know, it's there and you can put your Bible now. Let's now turn to the Bible. <laughs> no, that wouldn't be a good testimony. And, uh, but that's the external way and it makes a man walk. Praise the Lord. And uh, they can't see them. They haven't seen their toes for the last 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, but when, when you put on weight in the right way, and uh, the muscles grow, the bones grow, etc., et you don't feel, you don't feel, you, may, you, you feel the weight, but you don't feel weaker. You know, when you, when you become overweight, you feel weak. If you run one meter, you... <laughs> one meter. Not even ten meters. <laughs> but when, when you put on weight the right way, you don't feel weak. You feel strong. Hallelujah. You feel strong. You could, you could swim ten laps. You could walk for one hour. You don't feel anything. You feel strong. But in both cases, you put on weight. One weight is more external on the flat, the other weight is from the internal bone structure and from the muscular joint. So it's different. There are two types of weight. There are two types of barus. The type of barus that the Pharisees are trying to add is those that make, them, make people feel weak, incapable, bowed down. But the right type of barus 
is on the inside. That when you begin to, to grasp the understanding of the law, the justice, mercy, and faith. Look at the word uh, justice. Justice is, is uh, dikai or the righteousness. And mercy. If you want to learn more about mercy, go and minister to the needy and the poor. Go and visit them in their homes. Give something to them. Share with them your, your, your joy. And you could see how, how touched they can be uh, when, they, when, when, when someone gives to them. That is a feeling of God's love. Mercy. Show mercy. And uh, faith. And these things increase. There's a barus that comes, but it's a stronger measure of barus from the inside that makes you strong. Doesn't make you weak. Now, some cross-reference on, on, on Baruch that you may be interested in in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. Acts 20, 29. It says here, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, the word savage is actually the same word Baruch. If they were strict, they would have translated it heavy wolves, <laughs> fat wolves. For I know this, that after my departure, fat, chubby wolves come. <laughs> no, it's not what Paul meant. <laughs> what he means, <laughs> Shankar likes fat, chubby wolves. Huh? Praise the Lord. <laughs> He's laughing. I laughed when I saw that verse in the Greek. Say, what is Paul talking about chubby wolves? <laughs> Chubby wolves will come. No. The wolves who come are people who begin to emphasize the wrong type of Baru. Who will de-emphasize the spirit and the things, the principles of God and will hold on like the Pharisees and Sadducees to the things that will cause people to be bent down to religiosity without spirituality. That will burden people down. Those were what Paul was saying and warning. People who have no spiritual experience and no spirituality, who claim spirituality and try to put heavy burdens on people. And that's uh, the warning that came from uh, the Apostle Paul. Now, Baruch in chapter 26 verse 7, in a different form is Baruch Timos. 26 verse 7. It's used in a different way here in verse 7. A woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very barutimos fragrant oil. And that the meaning here is very extremely precious, heavy oil. And we know the meaning is costly. But here the meaning is the gist of the preciousness, the cream of the cross, the best. When it should minister to Jesus. Baruch, when Jesus said you have neglected the Baruch of the law, you have neglected the most important, the most precious parts of the law in loving things and using people. When they should be loving people and using things. Things will will wear down but people will grow up love people not things now I close with one little passage here from Matthew chapter 24 which is tied up to Baruch and to Philio in verse 12 Matthew 24 verse 12 and because Lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. It says, because of lawlessness, the word lawlessness is a Greek word, anoma, which is a negation of the word nomos. Nomos means law in Greek. So it's anti law or lawlessness. When there is no law, now Jesus is not saying there will be no law. 
He says that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. So Jesus is talking about, about righteousness and the law surpassing that of the scribes and Pharisees. Where they only got the shell, we must get the meat and the shell. So, when lawlessness comes in, because lawlessness abounds, where people will neglect principles, verse 12, the agape of many will grow cold. The agape will be affected, their love, their spiritual love will be affected, and thus their filio is affected. And the word here is the word grow cold. When I look at the word grow cold, I wanted to find out what it says in the Greek. The word grow cold doesn't just mean to lose your zeal. The word grow cold, the word cold is a word in the Greek, suge, suge so. And a suge so is a root word from the word suke which means soul. And what, what Jesus was saying here is that when lawlessness, when there's no more law, when people neglect the law, even the Pharisees, they got only the shell of the law. They don't really have, have, have the essence of the law. They lost the essence. And they lost their phileo. They don't have the real barus or the real phileo. And it, say, and it says that lawlessness abounds and the agape is not being affected. Not only is the finally affected, but the agape is going to be affected. The agape will grow soulish. Your agape love, your concept of spiritual love, will become just soulish. So the word cold doesn't mean that you lose your zeal alone. Because zeal is just energy. And energy, according to the law of conservation, cannot be lost. It is only transformed from one form to another. When you expand electrical energy, you don't lose electrical energy. The energy is still there. The electrical energy has been changed into other forms of energy that is light and heat. Energy cannot be destroyed. I don't believe there's such a thing as people who don't have energy to do something. You see, from the time that I'm born again, until the time that I see Jesus face to face, I'm going to be on fire for God. But why do people seem to lose their zeal? Let me tell you the reason why. It is not that they lose their energy. Their energy... There is agape, there is spiritual, there is pneuma, has been changed into a soulish energy. And all their energy now is, is, is bound by their soul, used by their soul, used by their physical demands and their physical body. Which is why when someone comes and says, Pastor, when I read the Bible, I don't seem to enjoy reading the Bible anymore. The first thing I ask is, what have you been doing with your other free time? Oh, I've been reading lots of papers, I've been watching a lot of TV, I've been watching a lot of this and that. No wonder you don't love God's Word. See, our energy has been sucked out so that you've got no more spiritual energy. Your agape becomes sugesto. Your, your spiritual love has become natural uh, uh, soulish and it cannot reach into the spirit realm anymore so don't ever say I have no zeal or energy for God because energy cannot be destroyed it's transformed from one form to another the problem is that we have allowed our energy to go into wrong areas and there's only that much energy that flows into our life and the life of God flowing in us if it's generally in the wrong area, you don't have it for other things. It's just like if you give a child five dollars, 
If they use up all the five dollars for ice cream, they have no more money for other things. Uh, if they use it for tithes and offerings, and they learn to save and they learn to do that, they can buy a lot of things. The same amount of money. You could give, every one of us could be given, let's say, a hundred thousand dollars. We could be taken, taken out, uh, uh, give, taken everything away from everyone, and everyone just walk out of this place with a hundred thousand, and to do whatever you think in your life. In two years' time, we'll come back. Everyone will be different. Depends on how we use it, how we divide and use and become accountable. We produce different results. Same amount of money, same amount of energy can produce different things. It's important in these two key words. First word is the word phileo. I conclude with this appeal. Let Jesus be your closest friend. He wants that. And part of the process of that happening is to learn to love your fellow man. Don't forget the first commandment by all means. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. But please don't forget the second commandment. You love people and you use things. And if you love things, you will have no energy for loving people. You will become abusive, manipulative, etc. etc. You have no more energy to love people. Do you know that it's, it takes energy to love people? It's not easy to love people. You have to accept them the way they are. Sometimes it's an effort to love people. You could reach out to them over and over again. Sometimes when you reach out sincerely, they doubt your love. But you've got to keep going. It takes energy. You know, it takes a great effort to choose to love. It takes no effort to choose to hate. It takes a great effort to choose to love. But when we Got the energy and the phileo and let it go with love, you will make sure into the person God wants you to be. Number two is Baru. Always go for the essence. The true type of Baru. Those things that build you on the inside. And Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you notice that the yoke is still there? But we don't feel it. Because there's enough energy to carry it. When the pressure within equals the pressure without, you don't feel the weight. When the barus within equals the barus without, you don't feel the way. But when the pressure within is not enough to withstand the pressure without, you will crush in. When the pressure without, within is greater than the pressure without, you will begin to take dominion and move forward. We need to build the true type of barus in our life. By learning to get to the most precious part of God's Word. God is not just a principle. God is not just a theology. God is not just attending church. God is a person who is real and who wants to be your closest friend. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy on our lives. Help us, O God, to see the precious from the temporal. Help us to separate the spiritual from the natural, the temporal from the eternal, And help us not to regard those things that are precious as precious, worthless as worthless. Help us, Lord, to get a true perspective of where everything should be. We ask, O God, that you open our eyes this day 
And once again, Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't have Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord and their best friend, Lord, speak into their hearts, Lord, that they may come to know you as a true friend who will never fail in times of need. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together and we'll sing a song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And as you sing that song, if you are here right now, you have not been born again. You have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to invite you to come over to my left here, where we have one of our pastors to come and pray with you for Jesus to come into your heart. And let me tell you, He's a friend who will never leave you forever. He will always be with you every time you need Him. But you must accept Him first as your Lord and Savior. Secondly, I want to open a special invitation. You know, sometimes we get too attached to the things of this life. And you know what we should do? We should give it up. Sometimes giving that up means taking it and just possibly giving it off so that we don't get attached to them. Or sometimes doing some things that will break. That's why it's good to give. It's good to share. It's good to be generous. Because it breaks selfishness in your life. Selfishness must always be broken. And maybe in our midst here, maybe God is dealing in your life. Maybe in your life there are some things that have become too precious to you, more precious than people. Would you be willing to give that up? Would you be willing to share because there will be something more you gain that is more precious than silver and gold or possession. No matter how old you are, some of you, when I give this invitation, you say, oh, that, that belongs to some of those adults. No, I'm talking to you young people too, children. Maybe it could be one toy that you want, you, you want so much that you never want to give it up. And it's your closest friend. You know, in God, even your little toy needs to be given up to Jesus. If you want to taste the fullness of Jesus. Maybe you're a teenager. There's one idol, or there's one singer, or there's one this, or there's one picture, or there's one, one precious thing that you never give up. You take it everywhere you go. Maybe it has become too precious to you. Maybe it's going to hinder you and make you a dwarf spiritually. Your filio is given wrongly. And because of that, you cannot love people. Because that thing sucks your filio. And up to this day, even though you're a teenager, you never have any close friends. You need to let that go. So whatever it is, God is speaking to your life that you know. Say, God, I want to file you and let you be my best friend. Come and we want to pray for you. What a friend we have in Jesus. A friend we have in Jesus. Those to be born again, you can come to my lap. Others of you will pray for you, whatever needs you have in your life.
is the trouble anywhere? Is the trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. We should never be discouraged. Sing it to the Lord in prayer. Jesus. 